morning, everyone. Terry, Terry Cannon from the Institute of Development Studies. Um, very much enjoyed the presentations. Thank you so much. What I want to emphasize is one point, which I'm not sure if it's in the work you've done, and what Barry has been saying about the, uh, the projections for poverty. Um, what does the report tell us about how climate change trends and variability will increase poverty? Um, uh, because, uh, to my mind, that is as crucial, if not more crucial, than extreme events. Because we will have uh, a, a majority of poor people in, in, in countries affected negatively by climate change will have rising poverty. And that will increase their vulnerability to extreme events. So I'm wondering what you're saying about that. And it, it hasn't come out in the balance of, I know you have very limited time, it hasn't come out in the balance, and in the executive summary, it says that in, in basically in one line. And going back to Julia's um, um, uh, the work on meteorology, uh, to my mind, the problem is not whether average rainfall changes up or down. It's when it comes during the seasons and the year. And that is a poverty driver. You know, th three years ago in much of East Africa, farmers planted three times because the rains came, failed, rains came, failed. So what, what can we say about how to build resilience when you can't actually know because of the volatility of the um, delivery of rain? Sorry, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll take a few questions and then come back, please. Just to follow on from that, uh, Zach White from WaterAid, I'd like to ask um, a question about the models and perhaps the tension between the poverty models and the climate models. So RCP5 assumes some sort of reduction effort, whilst it seems like a lot of the poverty models are based on backward-looking macro data made for adjustments. And I appreciate that inequality is the key driver in reducing poverty efforts. But I was wondering if you saw a tension between the increased resource consumption, particularly fossil fuels, that has driven growth for so long, and the assumptions around RCP5 and mitigation efforts. Um, so the question is really, um, would you characterize your predictions as optimistic or pessimistic? Tom, you said they were plausible, but I'd like to suggest that perhaps they're optimistic, and if you could <laughs> comment on that. Thank you. I'm going to work my way across this this way, please. Uh, Joel Havenstein from Tier Fund. Um, so it seems that the high-level panel have given tremendous political momentum to the wrong goal. Uh, it continues to uh, have us look at uh, li lives saved, which is not actually going to contribute to reducing extreme poverty. Um, this paper uh, gives some currency toward uh, $4 a day as a threshold, as an, as an alternate uh, way of framing it. I mean, I wonder whether that is actually going to accomplish what both you and Margreta have highlighted as absolutely essential, which is, which is changing the way that we do this in practice. Um, will people who he see $4 a day just think, well, we're already aiming at $2 a day, we'll keep doing more of the same, and that'll get us to resilience if resilience equals $4 a day? Thank you. Please. Uh, Bronwyn Manby from the Open Society Foundations. Uh, my question's about the disaster risk management capabilities and clearly addressing that, I mean, if you're looking at you know, the, the, government, the capability of the government of South Sudan, it's a very complex issue, leaving aside climate variability and <laughs> poverty and whatever. But are there specific interventions that one could look at that relate to disaster risk management that can be addressed separately from everything else about government in South Sudan, just to pick one example? Thank you. Let's, um, so I'd, I'd, I'd like to go back to the panel now. I mean, Julia, the, I think that the, there's one question about the, the modeling itself, but also mm. the, the, the question that Terry raised about the timing of um, yes. rainfall as a, as a key yes. factor. Um, you're, you're absolutely right um, about, uh, it isn't just about trends in climate change and, and so forth. I think it is much more about the volatility of the climate. So do the rains come at the same time? Are they more variable from year to year? Those are the, those are the pressures that farmers feel. Um, and we know we can do some of this stuff. So we've just completed a very nice program with DFID, um, looking at Africa and looking at how we can improve, make our forecasts more relevant. And we've been able to now, we now have an operational onset forecast for East Africa and West Africa for the rains from the seasonal forecast model. And there's no reason of why, of course, that wouldn't work because the model 
the same science underpins everything we do from weather forecasting to long-term climate change. That, of course, will be in the climate projections as well, in a statistical sense, a probabilistic sense. So I think, you know, we have to remember the climate models are real, they're weather forecasts, essentially, day by day. So the results of our simulations are results about what weather people will experience. And I'm very keen that we don't just talk about extremes, that we do talk about hazardous weather, and hazard then takes you through to the impact. And you don't have to have an extreme for, some, for weather and climate to become hazardous. And that, again, I think is a, a, an additional dimension we need to bring into this uh, work as we go forward. Thank you, Julia. Um, I, I think there's, there's one bunch of questions, Barry, which is sort of um, in your patch, but I'll also throw it to Tom and Amanda as well, which are you know, around the poverty numbers. So you know, for, first of all, the question is, to what extent does the modelling capture the potential impacts, the dynamic impacts of climate change itself as a factor? Um, also, there's a, there's a question actually from one of our um, online participants, Mark Pelling, from King's College London, ma making the point that, the, that some people argue that one of the things the MDGs did was to turn the spotlight on the group just below the $1.25 threshold rather than people <coughs> who are more in, in the more extreme poor category. And you know, the question of does this report provide a potential counterbalance um, to that? And I, and I think finally on the question of the $4 a day number and just you know some whether you have any reflections on on that as a potential indicator for people being you know resilient against falling back into poverty uh, let me jump in on those questions then uh, the uh, to begin with we are we are trying increasingly within the international future system uh, to close the uh, the linkages back uh, uh, from from climate to poverty, uh, but uh, uh, that that is subject to a lot of challenges. Uh, the f the first steps we've taken uh, have been to uh, to to forecast country by country the the likely uh, precipitation and temperature average changes uh, over time, and to feed those back to agricultural production. Uh, and to see the impact of that on the economic uh, well, uh, well-being uh, and, and uh, obviously uh, the, the poverty levels. Uh, what we have not yet done and what we want to do, and, and uh, I'd love, Julia, to follow up with you on this, is to, <laughs> is to take the volatility issue, to take the volatility uh, uh, changes that we anticipate around temperature and precipitation, add those into our forecasts also, and feed those back to such things as the agricultural uh, uh, capability of countries. I think we have the the, the, the basic elements in, in, in place, but we, we could use your help with respect to the, uh, the volatility forecasts and whatever uh, uh, we would need to collaborate in some way on the agricultural impact. So we've begun to take the, the answer to your question, Tom, so we've begun to take the steps uh, in that, in, uh, towards that, uh, but there's a great deal more to be done. With respect to the issues around uh, uh, the inequality uh, other than a dollar and a quarter a day, uh, I was actually, again, very impressed by this study for looking at the, the, the 75 cent level. Uh, this is something that you, you don't see in, in other reports, and the focus on the extreme poverty or on the uh, chronic poverty <laughs> level. Uh, poverty is a proxy for chronic poverty, and the attention to, to, to chronic poverty within the ODI analyses and, 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 and activities is something that I was very pleased to see. Uh, it's something that, that I think the, uh, uh, the work that we've done is able to make some contribution to. Uh, but uh, there, there again, I would throw up a, 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 some of the uncertainties and, and, and uh, unknowns with respect to that kind of work. We are assuming in, in countries around the world a log, as I said, a log normal distribution. And I, I want to elaborate that just slightly because it is important for those of you who are sitting there to understand this. 
Uh, that means that on one end of the of the of the distribution of income in a population, you have a long tail stretching out further and further to richer and richer people. Uh, at the other end, you have a kind of bunching up of the mean uh, towards the, the lower income level and a shorter tail. Now, in reality, in many countries of the world, uh, the population is not distributed log normally. It's distributed, for instance, in South Africa in a more binomial fashion, where you have uh, 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 two peaks rather than a single peak. And uh, there are some poverty forecasting out, there is some poverty forecasting out there that is increasingly taking advantage of the uh, survey information around those distributions to more accurately then I think we do at the very at this very moment. I'll, I'll admit this more accurately. Uh, uh, rep capture those distributions and the the patterns of movement in and out of a, a seventy five cents a dollar and a quarter up towards four dollars a day. Uh, now uh, we uh, saying that uh, we, uh, we have the ability within the international future system to look at four dollars a day or seven dollars a day, and some people even point to ten dollars a day. Uh, I've heard that number thrown around quite a bit as the number you really need to get to to be safe from falling back into into poverty. Uh, I, I don't know where that cutoff is. Uh, this is not something uh, that I, I profess to have any expertise on. Uh, I, I will I will uh, bow to others who who have studied this that particular issue more. All I, all I will say is that we we have the capability with these systems to forecast the four, seven, or ten dollar levels. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it to others to decide what what uh, really protects us from falling back into poverty. Thank you, Barry. Um, Mar Marguerite, could, would you like to come in at this point? There was, there was also a specific question on you know, the importance of thinking about capacity for disaster risk management that you might want to address. Um, uh, thank you. I, I think it's fair to say um, that in the areas of uh, early warning system and preparedness, a large number of countries at national level have uh, drastically improved their capacity and certainly have much more clear understanding of that that has to be done. Uh, but, but I think also as the report is pointing out, if we focus on this effort to reduce absolute and extreme poverty, um, there is uh, not that all the same uh, sense of capacity at local government level, uh, even though in the last couple of years there's been an enormous attention given to this. So if we can, if we can insist on that attention being at local level and how we can uh, both encourage national governments, but also in the cases where a donors are involved, to actually give a lot more attention to building that capacity. But there are also good examples of local governments, regional governments that have done what we think is the right thing. They have set their development um, goals around the absolute need to reduce vulnerability to disasters and not uh, segregating the two issues uh, into uh, different domains. And I think this remains, as we already said, the biggest challenge that if, if you cannot fully integrate this, and unfortunately the international system is, uh, when it was established, was copied on most national systems that you actually segregate two critical areas that need to interact very differently if you're going to tackle the root causes to disasters. So I think um, some good news, but also we have to keep insisting on the strengthening at local level because that's where it really has a significant impact uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Um, Tom, there's one question that you're definitely taking, which is, um, for, again, for one of our in, in line, online participants, which is about how did you get to the uh, country rankings and the composite assessment scores in, in the report? And if there are other issues that either you or Amanda want, want to respond to, please do. Well, let me first pick up Joel's point, actually. Um, Joel's... Uh, highlighted I think a really interesting tension that we face at the moment between um, the, the the wisdom of the high-level panel in integrating disasters target under poverty uh, alleviation or ending poverty which I personally think is a fantastic opportunity for the disaster risk management community to make some real headway um, but at the same time I think we know uh, 
not necessarily recommending the best indicator for doing that. You know, there is a big <coughs> difference between uh, looking at the numbers of lives lost, numbers of lives saved, and poverty reduction. I think the point of the report is very much to highlight that, and I've certainly gone on record suggesting that that, that wasn't necessarily the wisest choice of target. However, um, we have a political calculation to make now, and a really important political calculation, of whether trying to change or tweak that target within the high-level panel report will lose us uh, the place that we've got now. Um, and that you know, my understanding from, from colleagues well-versed in the, the, the politics of, of intergovernmental negotiation in New York is that you open a kind of a chink of doubt on something and then you possibly blow the whole thing open and mean that we may lose the position. So there's a lot of people head scratching at the moment saying, well, could we live with what the high level panel report has got um, uh, it, in order not to kind of take that kind of political risk? I think on balance, um, we will take the risk because uh, I think it's important to get it right. Uh, I think colleagues from some governments who are very well versed in these issues understand that it's not just about lives lost uh, equally they'd like to see economic losses what they haven't yet voiced yet is wanting to see something there on disaster and impoverishment and I think that's work to do so the post 2015 development agenda is one area to look at that but I think it's also really important to think about HFA2 uh, and to think about the interface between the two I think if we can have HFA2 focused around issues of <coughs> resilience, vulnerability, exposure that really highlights this poverty aspect, then that's a step forward. And if we can link that to the post-2015 goals, then, then even better. Um, work to do, certainly, but we hope this report goes some way to underscoring that. Um, how do we approach issues of the kind of composite assessment scores? Well, uh, I'd encourage anybody who wants to get into the nitty-gritty of our methodologies to read the full report. We have a 90-page a technical annex to go with a 100-page report. And so it's, you know, what I would say is it it's, it's can be dense stuff, so steal yourself. Um, uh, in terms of the composite scores, we ranked each of the individual hazard events in terms of exposure on a score from 1 to 7. Uh, essentially looking at uh, the extent to which there's been a kind of a, an experience of those uh, hazards in those countries over time, the frequency of that and the projected frequency of that. Um, and in each of those, we combined uh, in the multi-hazard assessment to produce a total score of 35 based on the five hazards we're assessing. Um, and within a, a, a slightly narrower index focusing on floods <coughs> hazard, uh, flood hazards, uh, extremes of uh, heat and drought, where we came up with a composite score of, of 21. So the most uh, hazard-prone countries, the most hazard-exposed countries, got scores of either 21 or 35 within our system. But uh, you'll have to dig much more into the detail about how, how we did that uh, and how we, how we then linked it with the, with the data that we've got on poverty and disaster risk management. But probably not right to go into too much specifics now, but I hope I've given a flavour of how we approached it. Corner him over yeah. coffee after, <laughs> the, uh, after the meeting. Amanda, did you want to say? Uh, sure. Uh, maybe I'll just pick up on that and also the question on um, the depth of poverty that we're looking at and whether we've gone beyond the dollar twenty-five measure, because actually those are both linked in one perhaps quick answer, but deeply embedded also in the report, um, is that we have broken down um, poverty levels looking from 75 cents as, as a proxy for severe or chronic poverty, looking upwards to $4 a day. And so the uh, poverty index score that we developed um, has its most, uh, the highest uh, ranking of vulnerability to poverty at 75 cents a day and moving upwards. So it actually begins at that metric and, and moves upwards. Um, so I think this, the, 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 the top countries that we are looking at on the poverty side are those which have the highest numbers and the highest proportion of people living in severe poverty and then moves towards $1.25. Um, and so this feeds into the ranking of countries. So when countries are ranked um, on, on these metrics, um, they begin uh, with these measures and, and move up beyond that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take one more bunch of four or five short questions. Uh, before I do that, I just wanted to very much endorse Tom's point on the post-2015 framework. I mean, it, it strikes me, actually, that there's a non-trivial risk that some of the really positive parts of that framework, leaving nobody behind, eradicating mm. poverty, 
is what is going to get lost. You know, the, the, you know, there, there are problems on the other side. I mean, we, we would all like to tweak various recommendations in a, in a different way. But I think it's not exactly as though the NGO community and governments are lining up behind a sort of strong agenda for eradicating extreme poverty. And I, I do think we've got a job of work to do there. So please, let's start from um, my right now. Sh short questions, thank you. Uh, my name is Gary Jenkins. Question mainly, I think, for, for Julia. Your slide on the circle of securities, um, I like very much. It seems to me we now start to, should now start to be using the language of security when it comes to talking about what to do about climate change. The question is this. The, uh, the study is largely focused on uh, what disasters and climate change might mean for poverty, income poverty, which was one of your circles. The question is, do you think it's possible, would be possible, to put some numbers around some of the things in the other circles, like water, food, political security, and, and so forth? Some of the MDGs address some of those issues too, so, so uh, 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 it would be helpful uh, to have Thank something you. on that. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Please, here in the front row. Yes, my name is Ula Bago. I'm in international development, mo mostly in social protection. But uh, I, I'm also getting back to the circle of security, securities. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, science and technology might, I is that in one of the others, or should that feature on its own? Thank you. I've OK, I'm coming back over this way now. So please. Yep. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Marcus Oxley with a uh, civil society network working on disaster reduction. Um, w one of the things we see at the local level is that people's resiliency resides around both their social, their economic and their environmental resources, those, those three basic capitals. And, and particularly when we look at uh, extensive risk, wi which the report <coughs> focuses on in the rural areas, what, what we see is that people are very, very dependent on their ecosystems and the, the functions of those ecosystems to actually deal with those disasters. And, and, and what we often see is that it's the economic development which is at the price or the cost of the environmental capitals, which then degrades that. And in so doing, they lose the regulating function, the w w which increases the severity of the hazard. They lose their livelihood sustainability, which is very much depends directly or indirectly on their ecosystems. And they lose the, the physical protection, the bufferting effect, that their ecosystems can provide. So the economic development degrades their environmental capitals, which then results in, 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 a, in a breakdown of their social capitals. The people end up impoverished, they've left their livelihoods, they migrate to the urban areas. And, and, and so my fear is that if we just kind of say, this poverty issue has got to be at the heart of the HFA, we, we, you know, we all make a sort of dash for growth in the belief that that's going to solve the problem. But, it, but it, the, the real thing is getting the balance right between these three pillars of sustainability and how do we get the balance right between short-term benefits and longer-term costs. Th those are the tensions. Thank you, Mark. Um, one more question over here. Uh, thanks. Um, Katie Peters from ODI. Um, in the report, nearly every composite list that you have, um, at the bottom of it, there's countries that are considered fragile or conflict affected. So, for example, in your DRM capacity list, category five includes Afghanistan, <coughs> Chad, Somalia, Sudan, Yemen, etc. Now, we know that in order to have functioning and effective DRR, you need a functioning and effective government. So it's not surprising that the countries that you highlight that are those that are most at risk of disaster-induced poverty are also affected by conflict, fragility and insecurity. So my question, therefore, is do you think there's a place to think much more constructively about how we undertake action to deal with both climate extremes and disasters in fragile and conflict-affected states? Thanks for that. Th that's a bunch of uh, tough but great questions. Um, what, what I would like to do is really to give um, each of you two minutes to reflect on those questions. And I, and I think um, 
they sort of fall into three areas, really. So one is looking beyond monetary metrics to wider indicators, food security, water, and, and so on. Um, secondly, the, the, the question raised by Mark, which... Marcus. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Marcus, forgive me. Um, which I, I guess at the heart of that is, is there a trade-off here that we're missing? The, you know, on the one side, we've got economic growth, which, you know, subject to what happens to distribution, is a powerful driver for getting poverty down. But, it, but you're arguing that at the same time, potentially, this can elevate risk um, and, ex and exposure to precisely the sort of hazards and problems that the, the report outlines. Um, and I think, thirdly, that the focus on you know, that many of the countries at the bottom of the list are conflict-affected countries and fragile states who clearly face a very distinctive set of problems in this area. So I think they're the three big issues to reflect on. Um, um, I'm going to give you so two minutes each um, on, on those, and I, I think we'll start with Julia. Right. Um, so let me just start with the uh, circle of securities. Um, this is a new way, f at least for us to think about, but I'm actually going to, if she won't have time to talk, but I would point you to Kirsty Lewis, who's sitting behind you, who has done some very nice studies through FCO funding to look at what a two-degree world and a four-degree world would look like and looking across all those circle of securities. And a very nice piece of work on, on for the World Food Programme in Africa, looking at the intersection between health security and food security. So this question of malnourishment. And of course, we'll have the working group two of the fifth assessment report coming out in March. Um, nevertheless, masses to do, I think. Um, in that context, I think partnerships in science and in delivery are absolutely crucial. And in the Met Office, we've made massive strides in the UK with the Natural Hazards Partnership, which is now recognised by the Cabinet Office and underpins the National Risk Register. We're in the process with working with UK CDS, and I can see Colin behind us, to develop the National Hazard Partnership International, which is a start at trying to bring the different science disciplines together. Um, and to begin to think about vulnerability and exposure as part of that whole mix. Some really good work to be done there. More for today's hazards than hazards in 20 years' time, but nevertheless. Um, as finally, um, I absolutely take the point about the intersection between economic development, ecosystem functioning, stresses on the natural environment. I gave the example of water in India as one example. We are all fully aware that the landslide risk in the shanty towns and so forth of places like Mexico City are due to the fact that the ecosystem is different and therefore you get flash flooding and landslides from what would normally be just a heavy rain event. So we see that all the time, we've got to factor it in. And finally, I do think focusing on the most impoverished countries and saying what can we do to help them be more resilient, better prepared, is something that we've been working through the uh, Severe Weather Development Programme of the WMO to help countries like Rwanda rebuild their MET service. And quite simple services that you can provide, for example, to the fishermen in Lake Victoria a mobile phone message that says you might want to stay at home today so that you aren't drowned and, you're, and then the livelihood of your family is lost. There are a range of simple things we can do, capacity building. Thank you, Julia. Um, Margarita, can I take you next? Oh, she's, uh, she's gone. Barry, um, I, I mean, I, I guess the question on potential trade-offs is a particularly germane one for the modeling work that, that you do you know is there an endogenous factor that's going on here that the model isn't sufficiently picking up at the moment I guess is Im implicit in the question actually I'm, I'm going to comment very briefly on that because I want to go to that that last question and with my the bulk of my two minutes here on uh, the trade-offs obviously the, <coughs> the, uh, the effort to develop an integrated modeling system uh, I, I think is something that's important to all of us. Uh, and, and, and the work across climate change, social change, uh, ecological change, uh, we, we, need, we need to be uh, uh, linking all those things because there are those trade-offs. Uh, the, the question is exactly right. 
But I, I do want to focus on the, on, the, on the last question around fragile states and security, because I think that, that in terms of the, the ability to meet poverty reduction goals, that, that's a, a really critical uh, issue. And, and it's something that we, we want to focus on for, uh, even more heavily as we go forward. We tend to conceptualize uh, uh, go governance uh, quality in terms of security, capacity, and inclusion. Uh, and, the, and, and, and accomplishing physical security is fundamental, obviously, to poverty reduction. Accomplishing governance capacity, ability to mobilize revenues and to use those effectively in the absence of corruption uh, is fundamentally important on top of security. And then the ability uh, to, to, to mobilize a larger population, uh, uh, to include a larger population in the governance processes and in the social change processes, those are all fundamentally important. Important. And it's in the fragile states where those challenges are going to be uh, especially severe. Barry, thank you very much. Amanda. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I wanted to pick up on the question around looking beyond money metrics and looking at other dimensions of poverty. And I think this sort of brings back to the wider discussion about the integration of various disciplines and the complexity within each of these disciplines, both to look at the situation now and the drivers of these things, but also to look forward. Um, so you know, simply for the sake of analysis, perhaps certain things have been glossed over, but I think there's, on, on, the, on the poverty analysis side, I think there's three particular aspects that we've looked at, and perhaps only at a very um, uh, introductory level, and I think there's a lot of work that remains to be done, and that's in terms of um, the depth of poverty, which we've discussed, um, and what, what uh, interrelationship that has with looking forward, as well as in terms of resilience to disasters. Um, it also has to do with the dynamics of poverty over time, and I think we've all, of course, touched on that, um, both in terms of looking forward to 2030, but more work certainly, certainly needs to be done, particularly at a, at a household level, and how the dynamics of these impacts um, move forward uh, um, at an individual level. Um, and then the third one is, is looking at the various dimensions of poverty, um, both, I think, as um, as outcomes themselves in terms of uh, an impact from, from a disaster or climate uh, event, um, but also as some of the drivers for, the, for these resilience factors. So looking at health and looking at education and how each of these uh, play out in disaster risk management strategies themselves. Amanda, thank you. Tom, over to you. Okay. Um, Marcus's point, I think, uh, spot on. You know, this is pre predominantly looking at outcomes, disaster being an outcome, poverty being an outcome. I think the level below this is to, can we begin to develop a set of, of indicators and factors that we know drive these outcomes and address those? Um, just to respond quickly to, to Katie's comment about fragile states, you know, I think it would be very wrong to leave this discussion in a position thinking that we can't do anything on disaster risk management in fragile states. I don't think that's the right comment to make. I think where there is simply not a functioning state, uh, then there needs to be uh, other agencies working beyond the state. And actually, if we look at the details already of disaster risk management, in many locations, we actually work on a projectized basis through civil society and UN agencies that tends to bypass the government anyway. Um, of course, that's wrong, uh, um, but that tends to what happens. So why can't we do that in fragile and conflict-affected states as well, almost? Of course, it's important to work and build government capacity to do this, and that's the only way we're going to get long-term sustainability. But simply, we're in a position at the moment where donors are very unwilling to risk development finance in those fragile contexts for these types of issues, and I think that's where there needs to be a real shift. Um, just finally, there's, a re there's another opportunity to have discussions about, uh, about this and about the future of the Hyogo Framework for Action uh, next Thursday at the Wellcome Trust, where there is a national consultation on HFA2 happening. Um, we also will have uh, DFID and Cabinet Office Ministers there to introduce the topic, so an opportunity to talk to them directly. But if you haven't registered yet and are available next Thursday to go to meet our friends at the UK CDS and the Wellcome Trust, please do uh, get in contact with Kirsty Lewis at the Cabinet Office. Details are on Prevention Web uh, and we can continue this discussion and make more concrete recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, so. Um, Marguerite has already left us, but uh, you, a huge thank you to her. 
Uh, Barry, I, I really hope you're going to go back to bed now and uh, get, get at least a couple of hours more sleep. But, but really, uh, th thank you for a fantastic contribution and, and for the modelling work that you've done and, and the contribution to the report. Julie, also to, to you and your team, I mean, I, I hope this is the start of, of a collaboration that will continue and deepen over time. And to Amanda and Tom for, yeah, and, and, and others in ODI who are involved in working on what I think is a fantastic report, which I, I hope it's not available yet, but it's on, it's on the web it's on now, the, yes. I think. So, um, so I hope you'll all go back to your offices, download it, read it, and uh, come to the meeting on Thursday. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you.